1 Corinthians chapter 12, the teaching application verse for this morning is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. And it says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the word, your word, that we're going to study here this morning. Father, I ask that as we study that you would uh, plant seeds in our hearts, that you would fill us to overflowing. Lord, we ask that you give us opportunities this week in which to share these things that we learn this morning. And Father, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. During the French Revolution, there were three Christians who were sentenced to die by guillotine. And if you're not familiar with the guillotine, what that was, it was the head chopper offer you know, that, that was set up and the blade would be way up top and you'd, they'd put you through this little uh, yoke down below with your, your neck through that and the blade would come down and cut your head off. It became very popular during the French Revolution. It's since gone out of style. But, but during the French Revolution, there were three Christians who were sentenced to die by guillotine. Hopefully it doesn't come back in style very soon. But one, one Christian... One of these Christians had the gift of faith. The other had a gift of prophecy. And the other had the spiritual gift of helps. Well, the Christian with the gift of faith was the first that was led up to the guillotine. And he was asked if he wanted to wear a hood over his head. And he declined and said that he uh, was not afraid to die. He knew where he was going. He said, I have faith, though, that God will deliver me. His head was positioned under the guillotine with his neck on the chopping block. And he, he looked up at that sharp blade and he said a short prayer and, and waited confidently. The rope was pulled, but nothing happened. His executioners were amazed by this turn of events they had never witnessed happen. And believing that this must have been an act of God, they set the man free. The Christian with the gift of prophecy was then led up to the guillotine and positioned under the blade. And he too was asked if he wanted a hood. No, he said, I'm not afraid to die. However, I predict that God will deliver me from this guillotine. At that, the rope was pulled again and again nothing happened. So the, the puzzled executioners assumed this is another miracle of God, and, and so they freed that man. Now the third Christian with the gift of helps was next, and he was brought to the guillotine and likewise asked if he wanted to wear a hood. He said, no, I'm just as brave as those last two. The executioners then positioned him face up under the guillotine. They were about to pull the rope when the man stopped them. He said, hey, wait a minute. I think I just found the problem with your guillotine. <laughs> if you can't guess, we're going to be talking about spiritual gifts this morning. That was a time when the spiritual gift of helps probably didn't help so much. At least him. So spiritual gifts this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You know, there are many arguments and divisions among Christians. Uh, things such as the rapture. You know, whether it's pre, mid, or, or post, or even if there is a rapture of the church at all. Incidentally, we'll be talking about those things in our first day of study in Revelation, or our first Sunday evening study in Revelation. Uh, secondly, baptism. You know, is it immersion or is it sprinkling? People have divided, Christians have divided over that. Sin. We've, we've seen a lot of pastors uh, falling into sin here recently. And the result is terrible for the church. It often divides the body or causes people to fall out. Pride in the church is often a big cause of church splits. But it can also just bring up divisions within the body that don't split the church, but just cause the body not to function the way that it should. 
Predestination and free will. You know, people divide very staunchly over those kinds of views. And, and they go to extremes, all the way to this side, all the way to this side. Meanwhile, Scripture is in the middle. And, and you know, those are just a few. There are many other sources of division between Christians. Another is spiritual gifts. But rather than causing division, spiritual gifts should bring us together for the edification of the body. But spiritual gifts have been the cause of many arguments and divisions among Christians. Today, in 1 Corinthians 12, we are going to be talking about spiritual gifts. Now, on both sides of the fence, we have stereotypes. There's the stereotype of the you know, crazy, talking, charismatic who, who uh, throws his hands out to heal people. You know, and people, Christians, marvel at this person who, who you know, knocks people over and, and just marvel at the power that this man seems to wield. But then there's, all the way on the other side, there's this other stereotype of the very callous conservative who, who claims God's spirit does not move in supernatural ways today. I submit to you this morning that both are wrong. Both extremes miss what the Holy Spirit is about in the lives of his people. Chapters 12, 13, and 14 are, are really one whole basket. Chapter 12 talks about the, the situation of the Holy Spirit's work through the believer. Chapter 13, the motivation in using Holy Spirit gifts. And chapter 14 talks about the proper operation of those gifts. All right, but we're in chapter 12 today, and there's four areas of focus in chapter 12. Now, I'm not going to be pointing these out as we go through the study. I'm just going to point them out to you here, so you may want to put some brackets by these verses in your Bible and, and write these things down there. And then as we study through, you'll notice that these areas fall into into these areas. That's a weird thing to say. But the first one is the gifts come from God. Now we're going to see this in verses 1 through 11. The source and the focus of gifts, because they come from God, should be God. God is the source of all gifts. They should be used to glorify Jesus. Secondly, the gifts are to be used in a corporate body. In, that means in a church setting. The section begins with verse 12 and it ends with verse 26 and it talks about the makeup of the body of Christ. Some are hands, some are feet. Christ is the head. And the third, all the gifts are useful and equally as important. And that's verses 27 through 30. They deal with how the Spirit works through that body. We all have gifts. But there are none of us that have all gifts. We need one another. And finally, fourth, the exercise of gifts should be motivated by love. And that's verse 31, where we're going to find out the real purpose of spiritual gifts and how they should be used. Spiritual gifts should be exercised in the power of love. And this is important. Exercised in the power of love, not the love of power. Not the love of power. Many Christians battle over these things. Sometimes the division is because of a, a lack of information, and other times it's just out of spite for other ideas. Sometimes it just seems that one Christian wants to, to get one over on the other, or be one up on the other. And perhaps that's, that's out of pride. I, I don't think that kind of thing could be out of love. Either way, one upsmanship, when it comes to, to scriptural things, it, it's, it's not glorifying to God. Divisions can also be for legitimate reasons, such as separating ourselves from false teaching and, and heretical things. I think that division over false teaching needs to happen more, while division over minor things needs to stop. That would change the whole landscape of American Christianity. Now, in regards to spiritual gifts, 
division can be traced back even as far as the church in Corinth. It can result from an overemphasis on certain gifts, as it did in Corinth, or an underemphasis on certain gifts. Or it can come because we pridefully assert our views over what Scripture actually says. Now, before we jump into our text in 1 Corinthians 12, let's set the context here. As we've already seen in our study, the Corinthian church had a lot of problems and a lot of difficulties. The church was divided. There were divisions in the church. There were arguments. There were lawsuits. There was immorality. There was confusion about marriage, about food sacrifice to idols, about worship, about the Lord's Supper, about the resurrection, and about giving as well. In particular, some people thought that they were more important than others. You know, they had the flashy, spectacular gifts, the miracle gifts. They could say things that nobody understood and loudly. When Paul wrote this letter to the church, he specifically addressed these issues. Many of them we've covered already in the first 11 chapters so far. Others we'll cover today and as we continue through this book and then move into 2 Corinthians. Now our chapter today gives us five directives to follow in order to exercise spiritual gifts in a godly way. And I promise we are going to get into the text here in a minute. I just want to set this up for you guys. So spiritual gifts can be kind of a a hard thing to really comprehend and understand. So I want to set this up for you all. So five directives Paul gives us here in order to exercise spiritual gifts in a godly way. First, be informed about spiritual gifts. Why not educate ourselves on those gifts that God gives us? Lots of Christians are are either ignorant of the gifts or they have been taught wrong, unscriptural things about the gifts of the Spirit. Secondly, be influenced by the Holy Spirit. When we come to the topic of spiritual gifts, our focus must be on the giver and not on the gifts themselves. There are lots of things out there to influence us. Paul reminds us that before we were saved, we were all led astray by many things. Now that we are believers, the Holy Spirit empowers and energizes us for ministry. And thirdly, incorporate multiplicity in your understanding. You you could say incorporate diversity in your understanding or variety in your understanding. I tend to shy away from those words a little bit because often they're, they're used as weasel words for compromise. Now, compromise, compromise is not what I mean. I don't mean allow yourself to compromise in your understanding. What I mean is that we all have different kinds of gifts, there are different ways to serve, and there are different workings of the Spirit. Fourth, identify your spiritual gift. Now, you would think that 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 kind of thing goes without saying, but there are many Christians who have never tried to exercise their spiritual gifts and have no idea what those gifts even are. Every Christian has been given at least one spiritual gift, and, and we have all been given gifts not for ourselves, but for the common good or for the, the profit of the church. Operating in your gift is both satisfying personally and edifying to the church body. Now fifth, use your gifts in love. Use your gifts in love. If we use our gifts in love, then we don't have to worry about all these other pitfalls and things. Our spiritual gifts, we should always be using them not to bring any attention to ourselves but instead to glorify God and to edify one another. Now, we're also individually edified when we use our spiritual gifts. It's, it's a very fulfilling thing. When we use them, I should say, the way that God intended. Now, having spiritual gifts does not necessarily make you spiritual, though. Gifts are to be used in love which Paul says is the most excellent way. 
All right, so those are five directives that we will receive from the written Word of God, which we are studying this morning. The Church of Corinth, they desperately needed instruction on this topic, and you know we do too today. Paul responds to their request for more information, as he has been through this chapter 12. Now what spurred their question was an ultra-charismatic minority within the congregation. This minority claimed a special place over other believers because of their use of tongues. Now, that sounds weird to say. It's not that they you know, were catching flies with their tongues or, or could touch their nose. Tongues, as we'll see in, the, in, in this chapter, is the Greek word glossa. You could also say glossa. I've heard it said that way before, but if you really want to say it right, it's glossa. It could mean a physical tongue, but in this context, it means language. And so when Paul speaks of the gift of tongues, it's not that they you know, could roll their tongues. He means that they were gifted in speaking other languages. Now, speaking in other languages is very important when sharing the gospel. That is because not all people speak the same language. And some languages have thousands of dialects within the language. Think of Acts chapter 2 when the people, all the people of Israel were celebrating Shavuot. And they, that was a pilgrimage feast. So they were all in Jerusalem. People that traveled from all around were in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples and they began to speak in languages that were represented there at the feast. And the church was born that day. Now I have to say, that manifestation of tongues was really quite remarkable. Now I also need to point out that the tongues that they were speaking were understood and were spoken to share the gospel. At Corinth, speaking in tongues had become an end rather than a means of serving the church. Now Paul affirms that the gift is genuine and that it is also desirable, but he is critical toward any of those who are using it for self-gratification. He's critical because the gift was being used in Corinth for exactly that. It's likely that this abuse of tongues was a reaction to the elitism of the other Christians in the church. You remember how we studied last week how they would have their agape feast. The, the more wealthy Corinthian Christians would have their agape feast set apart from the uh, weaker, poorer Christians. And then they would come together for communion. And instead of doing what those things should have done, it was dividing them. And so the, the weaker, the, the poorer Corinthians, they probably thought, well, hey, if the wealthy Christian, if the wealthy Corinthian Christians or if the wealthy others are, are going to puff themselves up with their you know, private agape feast, then we're going to exert ourselves by, the, by a strong emphasis on our spiritual gifts. They can be the hyper-elite, we'll be the hyper-spiritual. If the lead of the church could hobnob with important people and, and boast of their education and their rich feasts and use it to assert prominence or importance in the church, then the poor and the weak would assert themselves by being the people of the Spirit. Now today we still see this kind of cliquish stuff in churches and even between churches with a, you know, a hyper-elite group and a hyper-spiritual group. Covetousness within the church it goes back a long ways, doesn't it? You'll notice that as we study here that, that Paul's tone, which was stern, in areas up to this point, it, it, it seems to soften here. It, it kind of shifts into a, a softer mode in these next few chapters. And he's going to get into the most robust discussion of the work of the Holy Spirit in the church 
and in the life of the believer that we've received so far. What Paul says here is not applicable only in the Corinthian church. It's applicable to us too. But it applies not just to this church either, but the whole body of Christ. All churches. Every Christian has the Holy Spirit. Every Christian is also a part of the church. Speaking of our church here, we we all play a part in supporting one another. The gifts of the Spirit, they're wonderful, but they must be used in love and in a way that is useful to the church. Now, the goal of our study today is this. We want to gain a deeper understanding of the gifts of the Spirit, their purpose, and their use. So with that, let's dig in with verse 1. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1. It says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. All right, let's stop there for a second. Paul opens up here with Perry Day, uh, now about. Uh, New King James Version, now concerning. In doing so, he, he's letting us know that he's moving on. He's changing the subjects, and he's, he's going to the next question that the Corinthians had for him. Now, you'll notice that in this verse, gifts is in italics. All right? You will find, as you're studying through your Bible, you'll find words that are in italics, that are italicized. Now, the reason that they are italicized like that is to let us know that those words are not in the original text. They were added so that we could better understand what was being talked about. It's very... Languages not only have different words, different sounds and things, but words may have much more meaning between languages than other languages. Sentence structure can be very different. And so it can be hard to to direct, to, to literally translate something could cause it to be very difficult for us to read and understand thinking with our English brains, you know. And, and so they have very kindly done this, but they haven't left it to question. You know, that way we can look here and we say, okay, well, gifts was a word that they added to help us better understand understand what the what the text is saying. Now, the problem, though, is sometimes those things don't really help. Sometimes those things can uh, cause us to misunderstand what the, the Scripture is actually saying. The italicized words were added. They're not inspired. All right? So we, we can look here, and we can look in the Greek, and we can see that th- a better translation here would be, now, concerning spiritual matters. Paul is speaking about spiritual gifts, but his introduction here is more general. So it's a general, you know, a literal translation would be now concerning spiritual. Now you can understand how that, that might be a little hard for us to understand. All right, so Paul is going to be speaking about gifts, but this introduction we need to understand here, he, he, said, he brings it up in a very general way that he's going to be talking about spiritual matters. The gifts of the Spirit, they're not magical powers. They're spiritual. The gifts are the works of the person of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now concerning that work, Paul says that he does not want his brothers to be ignorant. This is Paul's first directive, be informed about spiritual gifts. Now, apparently the Corinthians were ignorant about these spiritual matters. Their church services were chaotic. People were fighting each other over expressions of prophecy and tongues. The same sort of power struggle that came out in other areas in that church existed in the area of spiritual gifts. Some people considered themselves more important by nature of their gift. And naturally, that kind of spiritual gift elitism 
resulted in division, just as other forms of elitism within the church did. Now, this is a topic that is far too important for believers to be, uninfor- to be informed about. But it's not too critical to fight about. John MacArthur, he wrote this. He said, no local congregation will be what it should be until it understands spiritual gifts. So spiritual gifts are important, but they're not to be divided over. Romans 12, 6 says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. And so we do well not on, to not only understand spiritual gifts, but to put them into practice. But first, it would be shrewd for us to define what a spiritual gift is. One of the best definitions I've come across is this. Spiritual gifts are divine abilities distributed by the Holy Spirit to every believer according to God's design and grace for the common good of the body of Christ. It's important to recognize that spiritual gifts are given by the Holy Spirit at conversion. On the other hand, a natural talent is something that we're born with. We yield our talents and our abilities to the Lord's work. We also use our spiritual gifts for the good of the body of Christ. Natural abilities are not exclusive of spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are not exclusive of natural abilities. Now, can I say that someone who spent years studying a foreign language and uses that ability to share the gospel is not expressing a spiritual gift. I think it would be foolish to to draw a distinction like that. We might say the same thing about musical gifts or teaching gifts or many other gifts. Just because it's something that you have spent time maturing in, that you've been educated in, does not mean it's not a spiritual gift. Now, the other way, too, we have to consider this. Just because you haven't spent time studying something or spent time being educated about something, that what you're doing is not a spiritual gift. Okay? Now, before we get too far into our study, let's let's go ahead and categorize spiritual gifts to keep it simple. A good place to do that is 1 Peter Chapter 4, verse 11. It says, If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus. I'm sorry, through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So we find here two primary areas of distinction. Speaking, And serving. Now, so those are the two distinct areas of spiritual gifts. Now, there is another third category that would include sign gifts, um, which some people say were a temporary thing. 2 Corinthians 12.12 says that these gifts were given to the apostles and were critical to the church in its infancy. Right? These gifts were especially important in the first century. That was before the, what we call the canon of, of Scripture was assembled. Now, there are two trains of thought regarding spiritual gifts and their, their use today. There's a view of uh, cessationism. That's a view that the miracle gifts of tongues and healings, that those things have ceased. You know, with the end of that apostolic age, there was a cessation of miracles that were associated with that age. All right. Secondly, there's continuationalism. Continuationalism. This is the belief that all the spiritual gifts, including healings, tongues, and miracles are still in operation today, just as they were in the days of the early church. 
Now, those who hold to that believe that the Bible, that, that biblical instruction on spiritual gifts is as relevant today as it was when it was first penned in Scripture. Now, while I can, I can, I can understand cessationism, I tend to fall more on the side of continuationalism. But whichever side we fall on, unity in the church is far more important. Jesus prayed for us in John 17 that they may be one as we are one, I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Jesus prayed that we would have unity. And he indicates in his prayer that that unity is a testimony to the world of God's love. We're all in the body of Christ. When we allow any non-foundational issue to cause division, we're not giving heed to the unity that was so important to our Lord Jesus Christ. Some say 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10 suggests that many of these kinds of gifts have ceased to function. I'll read verse 10 to 1 Corinthians 13, 10. It's just, it's right there in your Bible. You should be real close to it, but it says, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. Now, according to the cessationist view, the perfect refers to the canon of Scripture. The in part are the spiritual gifts. Now, the problem with that view as I see it is that the very next verses speak of the perfect being Jesus Christ. So it's my personal belief that most, maybe not all spiritual gifts are for today. So if we divide the gifts into those categories, we end up with this. Speaking gifts, uh, word of wisdom, prophecy, evangelism, uh, pastor, teaching, and teaching. Service gifts, administration, exhortation, faith, giving, helps, serving, and mercy. Sign gifts, distinguishing of spirits, miracles, Healings, tongues, interpretation. Now, if you were to add up all the, the distinct spiritual gifts, you would come up with about 20, somewhere around that area. Now, we should keep in mind that we are told to do many of the things that are listed as spiritual gifts. It doesn't mean we're all gifted in those things, but it would seem that for some things, not being gifted just isn't an excuse. For instance, while people may... people while some people have the gift of giving, all of us are to be givers of our resources for kingdom purposes. Likewise, we aren't excused from our responsibility to witness just because we might not have the gift of evangelism. Let's keep going. Verse 2. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit of God. So Paul says idols are dumb. Now, he doesn't use it the way that we would probably use it. Dumb means they cannot speak. In fact, idols are incapable of anything except for one thing. They have immense power to deceive. And the Corinthians were once deceived. Escape from that deception was by the intervention of the Holy Spirit. So Paul starts with a great foundation. The Corinthians were once lost, but now they're found. The Holy Spirit pointed them to Jesus, and now the Holy Spirit in them will point others to Jesus. Now I want you to think about what this means. That there are two and only two groups of people in the world. Those without the Spirit who reject Christ, unbelievers. And those with the Spirit who confess Christ, believers. 
The Spirit confesses Christ, and those who have the Spirit confess Christ. And any gift of the Spirit will point to Jesus. Any gift of the Spirit will point to Jesus. Pastor Chuck Smith wrote in one of his books, I can't remember which one it was, but he wrote about going to visit a church one time. I think it was another Calvary Chapel that he went to visit. And during worship, he was sitting in his seat, and he noticed that there was, there was one gentleman that liked to get up during worship and go to the front of the sanctuary and do a little jig thing. And apparently Pastor Chuck was there for a while, for a few days, whatever, and he noticed over the course of a few days that, that during times of worship, this gentleman would, would always do that. But he also noticed one other thing is that every time that gentleman got up to do his jig, he would pause and look back to see who was looking at him. We may have a spiritual gift that that is exciting to us, that that puts us in, in front in some way. But use of that spiritual gift should never, ever point to ourselves should always point to Jesus. In verse 1 of of chapter 13, Paul says he compares these things that that point to people, using the gifts in a way that that glorifies people or or makes people bigger in the eyes of of other people instead of God, instead of glorifying God, that it's like, it's like your, your kids, like somebody gave your kids a, a symbol set. <laughs> you know, can you imagine? That's like the worst Christmas present ever. <laughs> Our second of the six distinctives is be influenced by the Holy Spirit. No one led of the Spirit is going to utter a prophecy that goes against God's word or against the person of Jesus Christ. We don't know, but it almost seems certain by Paul's words here that it must have happened. And conversely, only those that are believers can acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. Those who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Now, given that the Holy Spirit is key to pointing to Jesus, we should feel that as long as we acknowledge Jesus as Lord, we aren't being led by anything but the Spirit. That's not to mean that everything you say will be as if God said it. We all make mistakes. But Paul says, don't feel insecure. The Spirit is leading you, so go ahead and step out. But understand again that you cannot do something contrary to God's word and then claim to be led by the Holy Spirit. In fact, a great way to test whether or not something is of God is whether it's confirmed by his written word. If it's not, then I would be very, very careful with it. So it's in this context that Paul, that Paul, 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 that Paul begins his argument here. Verse four says there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And what does the Spirit always do? The Spirit always points to Jesus. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit or the benefit of all. Paul is going to lay a theological foundation for us to understand all the gifts before he specifically focuses on tongues and prophecy. Now, he'll do that in chapter 14. Now, theology sounds like a big word. But it's really, 
quite simple in definition. It comes from two Greek words that combined mean the study of God. So Christian theology is simply an attempt to understand God as he is revealed in the Bible. Theological study is digging into God's word to discover what he has revealed about himself. So Paul is laying a Holy Spirit inspired groundwork for us to understand these gifts. Now because it is the Holy Spirit who decides who gets what gift and how they are manifested, it's not up to the individual and doesn't mean that you are any more special than any other because you have a certain spiritual gift. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. In other words, your gift is from God, my gift is from God, and they all function together in the body of Christ. This is our third of those six directives. Incorporate multiplicity in your understanding of gifts. The Greek word for gifts is charismata. Charismata. Charisma would be the singular form of that. We would recognize it as charisma or charismatic. Now the root word for Harris means grace. So then charisma is a free gift. It's not something we don't earn a gift of the Spirit. It's something that's given to us. Now look back at, at verse 4. And if you write in your Bibles, then put a number 1 by diversities of gifts. Now look at verse 5 and put a number 2 by differences of ministries. And in verse 6, put a number 3 by diversities of activities. These this listing in verses 4 through 6 has always intrigued me. What is interesting about it is the three different words that Paul uses. Gifts, ministries, activities. So gifts is charisma, which means a free gift. Ministries, or, or some translations say service, is diakonia, from which we get that word deacon or servant. Working is enerima, or effect. We get our word energy from that root word. Now, think about it this way. All real spiritual power is a gift from God. It's not earned, it's not achieved, it's not merited. You can go to YouTube and you can find their seminars where people will teach you to speak in tongues. And that's bunk. It's a gift from God. It's not a manufactured thing. It's, it's a real attention getter. <laughs> and that's why a lot of people want to do it. Now the same with prophecy and other gifts that are able to attract attention. These gifts, however, they're to be used in service to others, not, not to serve yourself or puff up yourself. They aren't to be a show. They're designed and given to have a real effect in someone's life. Now keep that in mind as we study through the rest of this chapter. Now verse 7 reminds us that every believer has a spiritual gift. And Paul is going to give us a list of examples. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. Paul isn't writing a textbook on spiritual gifts. He's trying to make a point about how the Christian should live their life in the body of Christ using their spiritual gifts as a power source. Verse 8, Paul says, For, one, for to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same spirit. Now, Paul is going to present us with three lists of spiritual gifts. There are also lists in Romans chapter 12 and Ephesians chapter 4. 
The fact that one gift or another is missing from this particular list only means that Paul is tailoring his list to the Corinthian church. So here's the list. Here the list is, is almost all supernatural manifestations. In fact, you'll notice that two things appear three times in this chapter, and that is prophecy and tongues. Those things were the big concerns of the Corinthian church. Another that occurs three times is working miracles. Now, some of these gifts, they're pretty easy to figure out what they are, but there are a few that are kind of hard to understand. Take, for instance, word of wisdom and word of knowledge. You know, they appear to be distinct from one another, as well as distinct from tongues, prophecy, and other gifts. The context doesn't give us any better understanding of their function either, or, or the extent to which they involve supernatural revelation. My understanding is that these two may not come from the same person, but instead play off of others, off of one another. One person may have a word of knowledge, and another instruct, an instruction in how to apply that knowledge. Now, what's the definition of wisdom? Wisdom is knowledge applied, right? I think we've all heard that definition before. Wisdom is knowledge applied. If you haven't heard that definition before, then today's the day. <laughs> Wisdom is knowledge applied. Knowledge is the ability to explain difficult things or know something that you couldn't have known otherwise. Now, sometimes God uses knowledge to cut through someone's tough exterior. Think about Jesus and the woman at the well. Perhaps sometimes when you're talking to someone, maybe you've had this time where you've gotten an impression about something, and, and then you, know, you feel weird even asking them about it. But you ask, hey, has, has something happened in your life? Is there something going on? Then they open up about it, and you know, healing can take place. Or, or perhaps, I, I experience this, this one constantly, you know, morning devotion time or time in, in God's Word. You, you have your devotion time, and then later in that day, boom, it's like somebody is talking to you and you realize, oh, wow, my devotion applies directly to this conversation we're having. It used to happen to me all the time when I was doing a lot of counseling. Wisdom is the God-given ability to apply knowledge in a given situation. You may share knowledge with someone, and then God gives them the wisdom to apply it. Teaching is, is often giving wisdom, applying God's word in an everyday life situation. Now, note that it doesn't, doesn't have to always be some supernatural kind of glow-in-the-dark experience. God can take someone's natural ability to impart wisdom and use it by guiding him through the Spirit. Verse 9 continues, To another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit. Faith is really the supernatural ability to trust God. Every Christian has faith to some extent. So this, this must be an unusual expression of it. So the faith that Paul speaks of, it's an above and beyond ability to trust God in a way that benefits the congregation. I find it interesting that Paul calls out gifts of healings here. It suggests that the ability to supernaturally heal someone may not be something that you can just call up at will. It's something instead, it works by God's sovereignty. And again, it's not, it's not to the glory of the person, but of God. And miraculous powers comes from two words, one of which we've already seen uh, the enoryma, 
and its power and, and dunamis is miraculous. And sometimes God just gives us the power to do something that we couldn't do otherwise. Prophecy is the supernatural ability to receive and communicate messages that are directly from God. It's both the, the foretelling and the forthtelling of God's truth. In, in the Old Testament, prophets who got it wrong, they were stoned. These days, Christians tolerate just about anything from anyone, no matter how wrong they've been. A good way to translate this would be simply speaking God's message. In verse 10, Paul continues, said, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one in the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So prophecy, the, the supernatural ability to receive and communicate messages that are directly from God. It's, again, the foretelling and forth-telling of God's truth. God gifts people with being able to speak his truth. I find it interesting that, that Paul groups prophecy with discerning of spirits. The, the New Testament sheds a little light on this, this kind of gift of discernment. This discerning of spirits, 1 Corinthians 14, 29, says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. Judgment seems to be sorely lacking these days among Christians. There are discernment ministries, but you will find that charlatans draw more listeners. I'm not saying that we should go back to stoning false prophets, but a discerning Christian will test what is said. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. And 1 John 4, 1 concurs with that. It says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. There are several ways to test one who speaks as a prophet, such as conduct. What is their conduct? Are they being self-seeking? Perhaps the greatest way is to see if what he says lines up with Scripture and points to Jesus. Distinguishing of spirits suggests being able to tell if what someone is saying or doing comes from the Holy Spirit or not. Having this gift would be especially valuable if you watch a lot of Christian TV. Now, in verse 10 we find another grouping of gifts, different kinds of tongues, and the interpretation of tongues. Tongues is that Greek word, glossa. And in this context, it, it must refer to a human language. The interpretation of tongues, it, it's a supernatural gift of translating languages into the common language of the church body. Now, Paul is expressing the diversity of gifts from one end to the other, Yet, as we can see here, they all function together in a very purposeful way. And the key we see in verse 11. One in the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So the crux here is the emphasis of one and the same spirit and the diversity of gifts. While the variety may be rich, there is only one spirit. The Holy Spirit decides according to his own counsel who will receive what spiritual gift. Paul makes it known that spiritual gifts 
they're not something to be shunned or something to be avoided. There's something to be desired. In chapter 12, verse 31, Paul says, eagerly desire the greater gifts. In chapter 14, verse 1, Paul says, eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. In chapter 14, verse 13, Paul says, anyone who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret what he says. And in verse 39 of chapter 14, Paul says, be eager, eager to prophesy. So the gifts, these aren't things to be avoided or to be frightened of. They're things to be desired. And you know what? Paul says that you have at least one. The Holy Spirit decides according to the wisdom of his own counsel who will receive what spiritual gift. You may have more than one spiritual gift, but you may also have just one. And the list in this chapter, again, this is not exhaustive. You know, Paul tailored this list to the Corinthian Christians. Now, as we continue to, to study through these next few chapters, we'll, we'll kind of drum up some more of these gifts. So we'll get a, a fairly complete list of spiritual gifts that are called out in Scripture. So you're given a gift, yet each believer may desire and pray for a certain spiritual gift. I may have one spiritual gift, but I may desire another. That doesn't mean that I covet what another has. Because then I am exalting that person. Instead, I go to the Lord and I pray. And I ask for that spiritual gift. The motivation should never be self. The motivation should be to benefit other Christians and the church. So spiritual gifts are not fixed, but they can also be received by asking. Now the Corinthians, and I think many people in the church today, tend to put value on, on the gifts. That's great. Except when the value that is placed on the gifts is above how much we value the giver of the gifts. Sometimes the gift is glorified over the giver of the gifts. There's thinking that's like, well, I have this particular gift, and it's, it's a miraculous gift. And so that makes me special. If we're not the source, nor do we decide what gifts we have, then we can't take credit for what is done through them. Paul stresses that the use of the gifts should not focus on the individual at all, but instead on two things. On serving and edifying one another in the body of Christ and magnifying Jesus. I should never shine because of a gift. The spotlight should always be on Jesus and the church should always be benefited. I can rejoice I can rejoice in the opportunity to use that gift. I can rejoice in the fact that God has given me a gift. But we have to remember that the giver is greater than the gift. 
tell you what, we're going to stop there this morning. Next week we'll we'll pick it up from there. I thought we would get through the whole chapter, but obviously not. As we, we close in prayer this morning, I want you to, to commit to something. This week, if you don't know what your spiritual gift is, I want you to commit to praying that God would show you that gift. And don't don't shy away from it like it's it's some bizarre freak show thing. Paul says desire those gifts. So pray. Pray that the Lord would show you what spiritual gifts the Holy Spirit has given you. Now you may know exactly what spiritual gifts you have. And if so... I want you to pray about how the Lord would have you use those gifts in the benefit of this body. Because that's important too. We're not called to hoard our gifts, but to edify and encourage one another through the use of our gifts. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much this morning that you've, you've brought us together here to study your word. And your word will not fail in our lives. You say that your word does not ever return void. So Father, we ask this morning, and we'll continue to ask this week that you would show us what spiritual gifts you have given to us and that we would be able to use those gifts to magnify Jesus, to share the gospel, to edify one another, to encourage one another. Lord, if we have any view of spiritual gifts that exalts them more than we, than, than we should, or if we have placed our attention on the gift and taken our attention off of you, then Lord, we ask that you would show us that and that we would repent. We desire that you would be magnified and glorified in all of our life, that the world would look at the church and that instead of division and arguments, that they would see unity and that they would know we are Christians by our love. It's the most excellent way May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face and his light to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, that's Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. And everyone said, Amen.